Hi there, everyone. Hope we're doing all right today. So what we're going to be looking at today is the National 5 Practical Metalwork paper for 2019. So uh, as we can see here, yep, you're presenting to everyone. That's perfect. Uh, what we have is the actual Practical Metalworking paper, and we're also going to be having a look at the marking instructions as well. So um, Metalwork paper, you can see 2.30 p.m. to 3.30, so you would have one hour to do this paper and total marks 60. So you're looking at about roughly a mark a minute right here. So let's have a wee look at the first wee question here. Question one, a brass door uh, plate for a sports changing room is shown below. Brass is an alloy. State what the term alloy means and state one property of brass. So um, these are nice and short answers, you can tell, because they're worth one mark. So we should be getting these done fairly quickly. So if we take a wee look at the marking instructions, we can see what they're looking for for this one. For A, an alloy is a mixture of two or more metals. So that's the definition of an alloy, but we've also got additional guidance over here, except the definition for brass. As you can see here, they have given you the name of an alloy. So if you were to say brass is a mixture of copper and zinc, they would also accept that answer. Any other answers wouldn't be accepted here. So that's worth one mark. State one property of brass. So brass has many properties. Resistance to corrosion, fairly hard, durable, malleable, the list goes on, as you can see. They would not accept non-ferrous. That's not a property of brass. That's the type of metal brass is. It's a non-ferrous metal. So these are the properties, and that's the type of metal. So that's how you would get two marks for those questions there. Moving down to one continued. The image below shows an attempt at marking out multiple door plates on a sheet of brass. So this is them wanting to make multiple versions of this. Um, and they've got a sheet of brass to do so. Explain why the image above demonstrates poor practice in marking out. You may use sketches to support your answer. So this point here, you may use sketches to support your answer. Always use a wee sketch. It will just help uh, demonstrate what you're meaning. You can write a small piece of text, draw an arrow to an image, and then that will help the marker understand what you're talking about. Obviously, you don't actually get marks for the images. It can just help you explain your point. Um, so don't worry if you're not the best at sketching. You don't need to be too accurate at all, as long as the marker understands what it is that you've actually sketched. So explain why the image above demonstrates poor practice in marking out. So I can already see right here, we've got a nice big sheet of brass and these templates are spread all the way out in them. So if we go over here, an explanation and or sketch that includes the following, there's too much space between the templates, meaning a lot of wasted material. So large gaps in between each of the templates. If we were to squeeze them a bit tighter together, we could maybe fit another two and we could get 10 instead of eight. So that's about using the material more wisely. One continued again. Fixing screws are suit uh, are to sit flush with the face of the door plate as shown. So we have an elevation of the screw, and we've got the face of the door plate with the fixing screw sitting flush in the door plate. So flush means that it is sitting nice and flat along this surface. It's not sticking up a little bit too much, and it's not sticking too far into the material. Question D, uh, describe how to use the pedestal and pillar drill to create the holes for the fixing screws. You may use sketches to support your answer. So again, sketches, may as well use them. And we can see here that this one is worth three marks this time. So main things to take away from this sketch, fixing screws are to sit flush. So we want them sitting nice and flat. If I look at this screw here, I can already tell that this is a countersunk screw right there because we can see the top of the screw head has a countersink edge. 
So instantly I know I'm going to need to involve countersinking when I'm using the pedestal or pillar drill. So go over here to question D. A description referring to tools processes that covers any three of the following. So any three of the following. So we've got possible four marks here that we could get. But obviously, we'll only be awarded the maximum of three. So holding or alignment of the material in a G clamp, bench vise, or hand vise. So making sure that your material's secure before you start drilling it. Reference to securing the twist drill in the machine's Jacob chuck and drill clearance hole. So that's about putting the drill in the actual uh, drill bit or rather the drill bit in the chuck. Um, the use of a countersink drill, so obviously we're going to be countersinking, or a larger drill bit. You can countersink with a larger drill bit, but if we already have a countersink drill, why not use it? Um, to suit the countersink screw head. Um, and then lastly, drill to the required countersink depth, or make reference to how the screw will sit in the hole. So that's just making the right depth so that our screw isn't sitting too far down. So that's how we would get three marks for that question there. Right, continuing on through the paper, moving on to question two now. So a metal skipping rope handle made of two separate parts is shown below. So here is the handle of the skipping rope and that's where you would tie the knot for the rope. Um, the working drawing for the manufacturer, um, the baton is shown below. So we have the baton or the handle rather. Um, we've got the overall length, the radius of each of the curves, and the diameter of the actual uh, cylinder shape or the baton shape. From the information given in the working drawing, explain what is meant by the term M5 by 12. So M5, if we remember, M stands for metric. So metric 5 means that it will be a metric five tap that we'll be using and 12 means how far down we will be going so if we take a wee look m5 means the thread is metric five millimeters or use a five millimeter tap so that's your one mark and 12 means the thread is 12 millimeters deep. So that's telling us that that hole is 12 millimeters deep there. On to the next one, state the outside diameter of the baton. So this is just a uh, knowledge of reading a working drawing. What is the outside diameter of the baton? You can see this arrow here going to the inside diameter. So that's the diameter of this part here. This one here, the larger diameter, because it's the outside, uh, so it's 32 millimeters, it would be. Go back and check. Yep, nice simple answer. They're only accepting 32 millimeters. The elevation of the baton is shown below. Feature A. State the name of the turning process used to create feature A. So feature A is a sloped edge on a cylindrical surface. So I already know that that's been tapered. So if we look here, yep, taper turning. Now, important to note, additional guidance. There's not always additional guidance, but right here they would also accept a taper and they would not accept a chamfer. The reason why they wouldn't accept a chamfer is because a chamfer is more of a 45 degree edge whereas this obviously isn't 45 degrees it's running and it's a light nice low angle so any other angle that isn't 45 degrees you would call a tapered edge and any angle that is you would call a chamfer so you would not get the mark for that um let's see describe two personal health and safety procedures which must be followed when carrying out turning process so this is basic health and safety there's quite a lot of options that we can go through so obvious ones use of eye protection you could use ear protection wearing an apron tying back long hair so it doesn't get caught removing jewelry no loose clothing and any other appropriate answer. So such like uh, staying concentrated uh, and stuff along those lines. Uh, do not accept responses based on machine health and safety. Um, yeah. So there's your options right there. Um, 
two pupils have set up the center lathe for knurling as shown below. So we've got pupil A here and we've got pupil B right here. Um, so two different ones. You can see that pupil B, um, they're, um, let's see, set up the center lathe. So I believe they'll probably be making that baton as well. So their baton is sticking out a wee bit and theirs is more into the actual chuck. Explain why pupil A is more likely to have a better, a better knurling finish on their workpiece. So the answer to that uh, would be so that the workpiece is as rigid as possible. So pupil A's work is going to be more rigid than pupil B. And that's basically referring to if uh, this baton is more further into the chuck, it's uh, gripped closer to the center point so it's got a better grip and it won't um move as much as this will um it's less secure so if you're pushing this in there's a chance that this uh, baton could actually move away and go at a bit of an angle so you might have a wee bit of an accident so always try and make sure that it's as secure as possible a way to fix that you could uh use a center bit um to Hold it in place, but uh, obviously this is much better. Name the part of the center lathe uh, that holds the knurling tool. So main part of the center lathe that holds all of the tools is called the tool post. Nice one mark there. State two properties for aluminium that makes it a suitable material for the baton. So um, usually when you're doing practice turning, you'll work with a piece of aluminium and that uh, there's a lot of different reasons that we could use aluminium, mainly because it's nice and lightweight. Um, you would also be able to accept light. Um, it also doesn't rust that uh, fast. It's corrosion resistant. Uh, resistant requires no finish because it's nice and shiny. Um, for how light it is, it has got high strength and especially easy to turn as well. Main things it wouldn't accept, uh, conducts heat and electricity well. Obviously it does do that, but that doesn't make any difference when you're turning it. Uh, aesthetic properties, it could look nice, it could look nice and shiny, but again, it doesn't affect this and any reference to aluminium being a non-ferrous metal. So that doesn't matter. You can turn all types of metal. Going back, so that's your two marks there. So you will need two of those answers right there. And large views of the blind hole on the baton are shown below. Uh, explain why a center lathe rather than a pedestal drill was used to drill the blind hole. So this is us still working on the bath in here and we have a blind hole. Uh, so a blind hole is basically a hole that doesn't go all the way through, it stops a little bit in. So let's see if we have a double check again, that's F. The workpiece grip is already centered on the center lathe. So, um, oh. I've accidentally moved this on to a different tab. There we are. Um, so we've turned the baton on the center lathe up until this point already. What's the point in taking it out and moving it over to a pedestal drill when it's already attached? We may as well just drill the blind hole while it's attached in the lathe is what they're wanting the answer to be. Explain why a plug tap is used when creating an internal thread on the blind hole. So if we remember, um, Taps are used for internal threads. If we go across here, down to this answer, um, an explanation that includes any of the following. So we have two answers here. So one of them could be to ensure the thread goes to the base of the hole. So plug, tack, uh, plug tap, sorry, um, to make sure it goes all the way to the bottom of the hole. So the thread's going all the way down and the plug tap has a full size untapered thread to the end, ensuring the thread is the full depth of the hole. So you're basically just making sure that the thread goes all the way into the hole. Um, back to this one. This is actually getting annoying. Let me fix this, go back. Pass papers and marking instructions, and we'll get the marking instructions back up here. And there we go, we're back. Right, so that was G. 
down to 2H. An enlarged view of the chamfer on the baton is shown below. So at the back end of the baton, this is the uh, knurled handle, we have a chamfer and that's our 45 degree taper, essentially. Describe how the chamfering process is carried out by uh, on the center lathe. You may use sketches to support your answer. So anytime we're making a chamfer or a, a taper, uh, we're wanting to use a uh, top slide or rather the compound slide, I should say, uh, to move our tool post at an angle. We want to set the compound slide to a certain angle. In this case, it will be 45 degrees for the chamfer. And then we want to use that handle to uh, move the slide across and create the chamfer. So two ways you could answer this, adjust the compound slide to the required angle and use compound slide feed handle to cut the chamfer or adjust tool, tool post to the required angle, 45 degrees, um, and cut chamfer with cross slide slash compound slide slash saddle. So that's one's the most easiest one to do. So if we try and focus for that one, but this answer would also be accepted as well. Moving on to two, again, keeping on going, we're on to, HI. <laughs> uh, a lathe tool is used in the manufacturing of the bath and is shown below. Explain the purpose of this tool. So if we remember this tool, uh, this tool is a parting tool and it's used to part uh, pieces of material. So if we have a look, cutting off a piece of metal while on the center lathe or creating a groove on the workpiece. If you remember, it's used for parting, but it can also be used to make uh, a sharp edge groove in your metal if you don't fully part it. So either of those two answers would work. Moving on to continued, uh, the hook shown below, the hook must be annealed before bending to shape. So this would start off as a regular bar uh, and we would anneal it before bending it to shape. So describe the process of annealing a metal. So annealing is a type of heat treatment. Um, so what it is, is heat the metal to the correct temperature. And then what you would do afterwards is you would slowly cool it. Uh, for example, you could cool it a wee bit faster in sand. And um, what that will do is it change the properties of the metal so that we can work with it and bend it a bit easier. Next one, the tool shown below, we're used to cut the external thread on the hook. So if you remember back to our birdhouse project, actually, uh, we made one of these hooks and we added an external thread on this bottom piece here. So we use this tool here. Name each of the tools shown. Uh, yep, name each of the tools shown. Tool A is our die stock, and our die stock holds our die right here. So that's for external threads. A centre finder is shown below, and it's uh, made up of two parts with a nut and a bolt joining them together. So we have the shaft, the nut, uh, uh, and bolt, and we have the locator. The locator is made up of three millimeter mild steel and is marked out as shown below. So, hole for nut and bolt, and we've got the datum edges. So that's the outside of our material. And that's the shape that we want to cut out and we want to get rid of all this hatched material. Explain why the metal in the center punch, um, oh, let's see. Explain why the metal was center punched before drilling the hole. So one mark, why do we use a center punch? To mark out where we're going to drill. And also it gives a small dent for the drill to sit in. So if we have a wee look. You know the following to accurately locate the drill bit or to ensure it does not drift off from the correct location. So that's talking about the small dent that it makes in. Uh, name the hand tool that would uh, be used to remove the majority of the waste material. So we have a lot of waste material here. And what you need to think back to in this question is this statement oh, right here. The locator is made from three millimeter thick mild steel. So that's quite a thick material. So that's making me think already I'm not wanting to use tin snips because that would be an absolute nightmare. Um, so instead, I'm thinking I might want to use a type of saw. Um, I don't know how big it's telling me. So all I'm going to say is I'd probably just use a hacksaw. And if we have a wee look here, yep, hacksaw. They would also accept junior hacksaw and chain drill and cold chisel. 
do not accept chisels. So if you're going to use a chisel and chain drilling some holes and chiseling out the material, you need to include that you're going to chain drill. You can't just say using a chisel. Tool is shown below uh, as it was uh, using the manufacturer of the centered uh, finder. Name this tool, nice and easy. It's a Jacob's chuck. Describe the purpose of this tool. So the purpose of this tool is to hold drill bits so that you can drill. And if we have a look here, to hold the drill bit, and you can also add securely and centrally. Identify which twist drill would be set at a higher speed when drilling metal by ticking the box below. So we've either got a 12 millimeter twist drill or a three millimeter twist drill. And the answer would be the three millimeter. Now, the reason why that is, is because the three millimeter is quite small and it's thin. If it's moving at a slower speed, there's more chances for it to catch. And if it catches, it's very weak, so it might snap. This one here is a, uh, much larger, much thicker, and it's a lot stronger than this one. So it could move at a lower speed, uh, but obviously the speeds will still be quite high. It's just that you'd always want this one to be a bit higher if you could. When drilling, swarf is created. Name one safety precaution that should be taken when cleaning swarf after drilling. So that's basically all the small bits of material that fly off while you're drilling. So um, main safety precautions as we're making sure um, not to use your fingers because you don't want it going in your fingers. Obviously, metal workshop, get a lot of cuts in your hands. You don't want metal getting in them. You can also use gloves. Definitely wear a wee bit of eye protection or cover your eyes so it doesn't go in. Um, again, with don't use your fingers, just use a brush if there's one available. And ensure machine is switched off. Obviously, you don't want to be cleaning the machine while it's on. Do not accept emery cloths. So any of these five right here. A painted finish is applied on the center finder. Explain one reason why this is a suitable finish. So they've decided to add paint to it. Um, and what they would accept is to present, uh, prevent the metal from dulling, staining, tarnishing, or rusting. So that's a good way to prevent that. And also it's a good way to make it look good, make it look aesthetically pleasing or decorative. Now, describe one method of applying paint to the center finder. So nice and easy, nice and simple. It's not a trick question. It could be sprayed on and it could be applied with a brush. Nice and simple, straightforward. Now, moving on to three continued again. Two dimensions from the shaft are shown uh, from the drawing below. Dimensional tolerances for the title block are also shown. So if you remember, while we're working in metalwork, we want to work to certain dimensions. So right here, we've got our set of dimensions for this. And we have a vernier calipers uh, down below. Identify the reading, which is uh, with intolerance, when checking the 10 millimeter uh, dimension by ticking a box below. So we've got three different readings, uh, or sorry, four different readings from four different people, and we want to try and find out who is within tolerance and who isn't. There's only one right answer. If we see, identify the reading, which is given the tolerance when checking the 10 millimeter diameter. So this wee symbol here, diameter. So we're looking here and we see that the tolerance for the diameter is to 0 0.2 millimeters and we want the diameter to be 10 millimeters. So right now I'm instantly looking 10 plus 0.2 would be 10.2. That's out of tolerance. Same with that one. Same with that one. This one here. 10 minus 0 0.2 is 9.8 and this one is 9.83 so this is just within tolerance by 0 0.03 millimeters so it would be that answer check there perfect tick 9.83 uh, 3g identify the reading which is uh, given the tolerance when checking the 60 millimeter dimension by ticking the box so again this time we're wanting to check the length of the shape and what we've got a dimensional tolerance or plus or minus 0 0.5 millimeters this time. So a wee bit more lenient. Um, so 60 plus 0 0.5 is 60.5. That one, that's definitely within tolerance. 60.58 out by eight. 
59.38, so we would have the minus 0 0.5, so 59.05. That's a wee bit further, and that one is higher than that, so it's out. So the answer would be this top one here. Go back and check. There we are. On to question four. A metal shovel made from two parts as shown below. We have the blade and we also have the handle. All parts of the metal shovel are manufactured from the same material. Explain why this is an advantage when recycling. So, look into this answer here. You have two options for it. The recycling centre does not have to separate the parts. So, obviously, um, if they're putting certain materials into different places, they'd have to spend a lot of time doing that. And also the benefit is just they can all be recycled together. Say one reason why recycling metal is important obviously i'm sure we all know why recycling in general is important uh, any of these answers um recycled metals can be used for upcycling um save finite resources stops metal ore from running out less damage to the environment now so you've got all of these reduces pollution reduces greenhouse gases you have all of these answers and all you need is one of them so even if you just say Less damage to the environment, that ah, is plenty. Uh, the blade has to be marked out, uh, shown, below in the, uh, shown in the drawing below. Describe how to accurately mark out the radius 15 on the corner of the blade. So again, you can use sketches to support your answer. And what we're wanting to know is how they've sketched this curve on this corner. So first of all, I'm thinking when I'm creating a curve on a corner, I want to first make this small box here, and then I want to use uh, my spring dividers to create this curve. Um, so following the steps, we have two different methods right here and some additional guidance. Candidates only need to reference one instance of marking out radius 15 on the blade. So you only need to reference that once for a mark. Method one, we want to set our odd like calipers to our radius 15. And mark center lines 15 from uh, each of the edge. So we're using our odd light calipers to come along this edge and sketch a line, and then also come along this edge to sketch another line parallel. Um, add mark center lines uh, for 15 millimeters uh, to each of the edge. Center punch where the lines intersect. So that's that small point right there. And set the spring dividers to 15 millimeters and then mark the curve. So center punch there to get a small um, divot for your uh, spring dividers to sit in. And then you can create that 15 radius curve. Method two, um, instead of using odd leg calipers, you could say you can measure with a seal rule and use an engineer square to use those two lines. So you could either say odd leg calipers or you could use steel rule and engineer square. Either way is fine. Um, now, it's a good practice uses a center punch to lightly mark lines after scribing as shown below. State the name of this process. So uh, this helps us see where our line is once we've marked it out and the name for that would be witness marks. So nice and easy, only answer one mark. State two safety checks that should be carried out in the pedestal pillar drill prior to switching on. So again, basic health and safety. Um, go and we have a large variety of different answers. Uh, so the guard must be placed. The chuck key must not be left in. Check emergency stop. Uh, machine be set at the correct speed and drill bit secure and anything uh, referencing to checking parts in general so all we need to think of is two answers of them so two of these after drilling one of the holes ended up with a ragged edge on the underside of the material shown below ragged edge underside of the material so once you drill through describe how to remove the ragged edge so ragged edge we can also call burr so we could either remove it with a large drill bit remove it a uh, burr with a countersink um remove it with a center drill a deburring tool or a round file so um they want you to be specific they want you to say round file not a file and also emery cloth would not be accepted for that so just one of these answers right here 
The corners of the shovel blade are uh, to be joined by brazing, uh, as shown below. Describe the process of brazing in the corners. You may use sketching to support your answer. Um, so brazing is basically taking um, a different type of metal that has a higher, uh, that has a sorry lower melting point um, than the metal that you are working with here, and using it to join up each of the pieces of the metal with the higher melting point. So, uh, four mark question here. Obviously, before you're using it, you want to make sure your metal is nice and clean. So, remove dirt and grease from the joint. Um, apply flux to the joint or the brazing rod. Heat the metal to the correct temperature and apply the tip of the brazing rod to the joint, allowing the rod to melt and fill the joint. So, you're using uh, the rod to melt, uh, to heat it up to its melting point, and then it will melt into this corner, and that will join the two pieces of metal together. So that is how you would answer that question. Candidates must be award uh, or can be awarded one mark for using uh, for the use of brazing rod with no additional description. So um, heat the metal to correct uh, temperature, or apply the tip of the brazing rod. Even if you just write brazing rod, that's fine. You get a mark for that. Um, on to the next one. Continued. The shovel is to be finished by blowing. Describe the process of blowing, and this is worth two marks here. Um, so first of all, you want to heat the metal to the correct temperature. Um, so each metal will have a different type of temperature that you want it to be at. And then you want to either quench it into used engine oil, graphite powder, or suitable alternatives to allow the carbon to coat the outside. So this is basically... Um, putting a coating on our material. Down to this one, continued, uh, the handle and the blade are joined together by the process of riveting, as shown below. So we have the blade, we have the handle, and we have two small rivets. So name the type of rivet this is. So this is a snap head rivet. There we go. And now what we want to do is we have the steps taken to use this snap head rivet. So they've already given us step one, step three and four, and we want to figure out step two and five. So cut the rivet to the correct length. Uh, swell, oh, excuse me. <laughs> um, swell the rivet to the flat face of the hammer, form the rivet head uh, with the ball pin of the hammer. So the answers that they are wanting you to fill in. Number two, Use the rivet set to bring the metal together. Um, so the rivet snap set uh, comes with those rivets and form the head with the snap. So that's what you want to do for these answers here. Moving on, I think this may be coming to the end of the paper, end of question paper. Nice and easy last question, worth a lovely five marks. So naming the tool or that rather naming the tool and also naming the purpose of the tool. So what we have here, we have a folding bar um, and the purpose of the tool is to fold pieces of sheet metal. We have 10 snips here. Uh, the description of this would be to cut pieces of sheet metal to, um, let's see. And now we've not got the name of the tool, but we do have the description, uh, straight metal, or other tools, uh, or not, or to shape metal. Um, so we have a type of hammer here. Obviously, they'll want you to be specific with it. So we can see at the end here, uh, we've got a ball. So it's a ball peen hammer would be the answer for that. Hide mallet. Now, hide mallet, technically still a type of hammer. Um, but the difference is that it's a bit softer so while we're using this to hit material chances are that it won't dent the material but this one would if you hit it off metal so it's better to use a softer material so that it doesn't dent or damage um last one to join two pieces of sheet metal together through pre-drilled holes this one here is what we use uh, for a pop rivet so this would be a rivet gun go in and check all the answers to bend, fold, hold sheet metal, one mark for our folding bars. For cutting sheet metal, one mark for our tin snips. 
Um, purpose of the tool, to strike metal or other tools or to shape metal, it would be a ball peen hammer. Hide mallet, for shaping bending metal without denting or scratching, so make sure you add without denting or scratching. And then to join pieces of metal together through the pre-drilled holes would be a pop rivet gun where they would also accept pop riveter or rivet gun. So either of those two. So hopefully that was uh, good for you, going over the answers a little bit and kind of getting a gauge to see how to get full marks on each of these questions. And hopefully when you have a wee look over it, if you got anything wrong, you can have a wee look and see where you did it and try and correct it. All right.